What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Thursday, June 13th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand-Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, ADNOC moves ahead with huge LNG export project with the UAE. We will fly back to the United States, then uncover U.S. LNG that shipped to Asia is still cleaner than cool coal. Who would have thought? Uh, we'll stay in the U.S. Houston Energy Company to build largest new refinery in half a century. You love to see it. And Bank, Citibank, now is saying oil could crash to sub-60 level. Interesting. Taking a little bit different approach than our friends over at Goldman Sachs. Stu will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets. And, and, and really what we're going to talk about is, one, Fed deciding to keep interest rates the same. That happened yesterday, Wednesday afternoon. And then a pretty crazy EIA report, which we will cover in depth. And then we'll wrap it up with Matador Resources going ahead and announcing a, a, about a one $1.9 billion all cash transition uh, to beef up some of their Delaware Basin uh, acreage. Um, a pretty interesting deal. We will dive into all that and a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's start with our buddies over there with Adnock. ADNOC moves ahead with huge LNG export project in the UAE. Abu Dhabi's national oil company, ADNOC, is taking the final investment decision to move forward with the oh, yeah. Rural's LNG project. It's pretty darn cool. Listen to this, Michael. It will more than double the existing LNG production capacity in the UAE. Holy smokes, Batman. Listen to these numbers. They bought, ADNOC bought an 11.7 11 stake in phase one of next decade's Rio Grande LNG export project in Texas. That is nuts. Yeah, no, that's down near Brownsville. It's the first U.S. LNG project that's, quote unquote, offering expected emissions reductions of more than 90 percent through an approved carbon capture and storage project. Um, we know they've also signed a 20 year offtake LNG agreement with uh, the Rio Grande LNG train for with next decade. So they're also going to be the ones buying it as well. They're going to own a little bit of the, the export facility and they're going to also be the one that's that's buying it. So love to get on that. I mean, these these. You know, these these Middle nuts. Eastern countries are starting to make massive investments in LNG. They're allowed to think 20, 30 years in the future because that's the time frame in which they look at a little bit different than I think what happens here in the United States. Um, but it's pretty big. That project there over in UAE, Stu, it's going to be about $5.5 billion. And they awarded, they also awarded a what they call an EPC contract, which is just all of the uh, um, engineering, procurement, and construction stuff. For, Isn't uh, that nuts? Side. I'm very happy for him. Anytime we can see long-term LNG contracts, I'm all excited. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. What's next? Let's go to U.S. LNG shipped to Asia is still cleaner than coal. Michael, let's go through these top bullet points and some numbers here. U.S. LNG shipped to Asia has a new lower value chain emission footprint than other coal-fired generation, even over longer distances. I was, I'm shocked. Uh, reducing methane leakages in the LNG value chain can widen the emissions gap. Wow. Don't mm -hmm. pull my finger on the boat is what they just translates that to. Uncertainties regarding methane emissions and variations in emissions intensify between different sources and types of LNG and coal. Coal's still not clean. I mean, but if you do it right, it can be. Greenhouse gas emissions from other energy sectors are high. And when you take a look at the life cycle emission for LNG for coal compared to coal generations, that little chart there in the center of it from Rice to everybody's over there at Rice Dad, that's pretty amazing. When you ship coal and then burn coal, it's bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is kind of like a duh. Like if, if but, yeah, sometimes, uh, it, and so for all the people that are against LNG, AKA the Biden administration with their LNG exports, this is the stuff that we'd be looking at because if the China can't get their hands on LNG, well, guess what? They're going to keep burning coal because they don't care. Let's help the planet yep. and the planet needs LNG. 
I'm quote, I'm putting word. The real for today's episode has to be Stu. Let's help the planet. You wouldn't, wouldn't have thought I'd have heard that. No, you want to kill all the whales. I want that to I save do. the planet. I'm all about saving people and humanity. It's pretty sad when the old guy in the room is the humanitarian. Okay. Let's go to the next one. That's but the I, word I, I'd use to describe you, Stu, is humanitarian. What's next? Human is what nobody calls me. I mean, <laughs> a Houston Energy Company to build the largest refinery in half a century. Listen to this. It will process more than 160,000 barrels of gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel from shale oil production. It's pretty interesting. Element Fuel Holdings is spending between three and four billion on the project, which will produce more than 160,000 barrels per day of diesel uh, jet fuel, and uh, it's pretty cool. I know. What's also crazy is that Element Fuel Holdings is a relatively new company. They also say they intend to produce enough hydrogen to supply all of the refinery's power needs, which is going to apparently, according to them, significantly reduce their emissions compared to the older refineries. Again, this is a Houston-based firm. You know, I would have expected a bigger boy to get one of these. You know, this isn't a Shell. This isn't an Exxon. No. This isn't a Chevron. I mean, this is a, a smaller company. It's good to see. I'm glad they went ahead and got this approved down there in Brownsville. But I, it goes to show you how necessary new refineries are and how new you can make them, especially if you can produce enough hydrogen where you don't have to – you can run itself. It's a oh. self-perpetuating refinery. And and uh, the fact that we got a new one since fifty years, that to me is out of the park huge. It's it's pretty and it's good. It's gonna provide a thousand new jobs. We like jobs. We love jobs. That's the key. All right. Let's go into Citibank here. City says oil could crash to sub sixty level. You know, I don't know how to price oil anymore. All I know is we got a trading desk now and we're getting requests for buying and selling crude. So might as well have a story about it here. City analysts have painted a bleak picture for the oil market. I disagree with them, but forecasting a significant price drop by 2025, according to the latest note, a $60 a barrel for Brent. I, I disagree. But then again, what do I know? Well, I think, I mean, let's hear what they're saying here. You know, their, their, their report, I mean, if you dive into their report a little bit, they basically say the short-term volatility may lead to some upside risks, though that their longer-term trend is bearish. You have to realize that's 60% Brent as well. They're not talking about WTI. You know, I, I think what they're doing is, the, is they're attempting to read the tea leaves on the opposite side and make the bearish case for an oversupplied market. It's really the only way you can get to this number is 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 really trying to figure out okay you know this is uh, this i guess what am i trying to say the way to make a bearish case has everything to do with we're oversaturated on oil i mean we're, right. we're about to see the eia come out today if you're looking down that road you know and you're looking it through that lens i could see maybe how you get to this number but that's a pretty drastic cut i mean and and it would and and maybe what they're and maybe what they really do is in anticipating a trump administration Who's gonna ask, Who's gonna come in and encourage, and people are gonna be more encouraged to drill. On the contrary, how more productive, how much, how much more money are you going to make at fifty five, fifty dollar WTI drilling new wells than you are just producing your current production base at seventy five? Who knows? Exactly. But also, let me ask this: contrastingly, a city's outlook for copper is bullish. With a projected price surge to twelve thousand per ton, are you watching copper prices? And do you think that that is a good number? Because if they're calling for uh, the bear in on oil, are they bullish on copper? And how does that number sound to you? I ain't. I ain't watching copper, unfortunately. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna have to take. I'm gonna have to read more research on that. I'm surely not gonna take one bank's perspective. What I find interesting that City is doing is you can. Everybody is bullish on oil. You've got. We know where J.P. Morgan. We know where Goldman Sachs sits. City's kind of pasted the opposite one. And and again, I'm not sure if this has much to do with where they see the U.S. election going in terms of if now that you mentioned that, West starts think... pumping a lot more oil. Well. 
price is only going to go down because the more supply, if we're already oversupplied and you anticipate more oil coming online in a Trump administration versus a Biden administration, uh, last time, last maybe time that's president, what they're thinking. Last time President Trump had some really low oil prices. He filled it, was, it was low, even without COVID. Oh, absolutely. So, well, all right, we'll jump over here and, and, and cover a pretty crazy EIA crude oil inventory build. But before we do that, guys, we got to pay the bills. As always, the news and analysis you just heard is brought to you by the world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. You can go in and hit the description below. Check out all of the links to the articles that we talked about, timestamps um, to all the different segments. They may be plus or minus 30 seconds. Um, and then you can also, as Stu mentioned, check out our aforementioned trading desk, which we'll have a link in the bio there. Um, if you're looking to buy, sell, or source LNG, crude oil, jet fuel, jet fuel. any type of you know, what a, you know, refined product, you can, you know, we are, are are definitely in the market for that. So go ahead and hit that description below, whether it's U.S. or international, whether you're buying or selling, we'll get you connected and get you, get that marketplace going. So again, hit that, that's energynewsbeat.com backslash trading desk. Uh, Stu, a pretty interesting day. I mean, overall markets, you know, are, are you know, we're, we're recording this Wednesday afternoon. Things are sort of in a little bit of a, a tumble, mainly due to the fact that uh, the Federal Reserve came out today at about or came out on Wednesday at about 2 p.m. And, and and Jerome Powell announced that there is no rate cut. They're going to stick at that guidance of a 225.25 to five and a half percentage points. They he revised down as well the number of rate cuts. Remember at the beginning of the year there was an expectation stated from the Fed that they were going to do three rate cuts. He's now said we may only expect one. This comes after a a scathing letter, and I say that as massive sarcasm from Elizabeth Warren and and two other Senate uh, U.S. senators talking about how we need to lower interest rates because that's what you, the U.K. is doing. And I'm like, great, we should all we should definitely be doing what the UK is doing. Absolutely, we should be doing what the UK is doing. And if you can't smell the sarcasm (laughs) dripping off my breath, then I'm sorry to hear that. I'll probably move closer to the mic. So that's really what's driving markets. They were up about one and a half percentage points today, um, currently or on Wednesday, currently going, you know, currently sitting here uh, about a quarter, about three quarters of a percentage point and tumbling NASDAQ just up a little bit over one percentage point. But again, tumbling there, US two and 10 year yields down 1.6 percentage points and 1.8 percentage points there. So U.S. interest rates take a uh, two and 10-year yields take a nice tumble there uh, with the 10-year actually doing worse than the two-year dollar index down half a percentage point. Bitcoin fairly stable. It's up about uh, uh, one percentage point, 67,809. But as as expected, it will probably continue to rise in face of, of no rate cuts. Crude oil up about a half percentage point after a pretty tumultuous day, a relative to uh, relative to where obviously a, a interest rate cut would have been bullish for oil not seeing and seeing a, a revisement down of cuts doesn't necessarily help it's sitting at 78.29 and Brent oil 82.24 you know really what we saw was an inventory build from the EIA, which was unexpected, as I mentioned, you know, the API yesterday did about a 2 million barrel draw. Well, today we saw about a 3.7 million barrel build from the EIA, and that's compared with a build of about 1.2 of last week. And then, as I mentioned, the API crude oil inventory guess. Um, we also did see a gasoline inventory build of about 2.6 million barrels um, with production averaging about 10.1 million barrels a day. And in distillates, we showed an inventory increase of about 900,000 and production averaging about 5 million million barrels that's compared with uh, a 3.2 million barrel increase in distillate with 5.1 million barrels per day of distillate production. I mean, pretty uh, pretty substantial build here. It's really kind of, there, there, there was an interlocking moment there when the report came where oil was sitting just above $79 and took a tumble all the way to, you know, the mid 70, you know, the mid 77 50s has since climbed its way back up to where it's sitting now, 78 30 as we record this. So, you know, movers and shakers there, you know, we're interesting to see how Citibank comes out later this year and, and justifies their justifies their prediction, depending on where things go from here. 
You know, the last thing I want to talk about is Matador Resources. They come out today and announce a, quote, strategic bolt-on acquisition in the Delaware Basin. Um, if you're reading the press release, pretty interesting. Meridev acquisition. Um, they go ahead and swoop up for an all-cash payment of $1.9 billion. Meridev is a portfolio company of the aforementioned NCAP Resources. This is the second time that Matador has come in and swooped up an NCAP backed private equity company. Uh, back in 20, early 2023, they went ahead and swooped up Advanced Advanced Energy, which is another NCAP company. So, you know, maybe there's something to, to watch out for there in terms of anytime NCAP, spin, NCAP spins up a portfolio company, it'll be interesting to see where Matador comes down the line. Again, Matador. You know, their strongest position there is in the Delaware Basin, which is on the New Mexico and, you know, the western New Mexico or the western side of the Permian Basin, which encompasses eastern New Mexico and the Horn of Texas right there. And that's their largest position. They went, they go ahead and with this acquisition add about 190,000 net acres. Um, or excuse me, that's their total acreage count, excuse me, and their uh, amount of uh, locations that they go ahead and purchase is somewhere uh, around 321, which brings their total uh, net locations up to about 2,000. To give you guys an idea, you know, on the Ameridev assets, they go ahead and uh, swoop them up. Uh, PDP 10 on that is about $1.46 So you can see a little bit of a premium there, you know. What's interesting is that they expect the, the adjusted EBITDA of those assets was about 425 to 475 as of strip pricing. That's a 4.2x multiple on EBITDA relative to the purchase price, which is a little bit crazy. And I think has a lot to do with the fact that <laughs> a lot to do with the fact that they feel like there's some upside relative to the the proved developed you know, resources or, or some of the PUDs, you know, it's also a 47,000, which basically works out to a 47,000 per flowing BOE metric, which, I mean, those are two really, really big numbers. And there's a lot that's interesting about this deal. It's a very nice consolidated piece of acreage down there in the Delaware basin. It's very contiguous. It's extremely helpful. It's 33,000 acres total. 99% of that operated. Uh, it's about 300. I mentioned 71 net locations, all with about 86% working interest. Obviously you're talking, you know, your, your wolf camp and your bone Springs. It's, it's, you know, they, they, they talk a lot about, you know, their methodology of estimating inventory. We could get into that, you know, pretty crazy. There also is a, a 19% stake in the Pinon midstream, which kind of uh, gathering and treatment facility, which increases your ability for gas takeaway. It's one of the big problems out there in the Delaware basin. So, you know, Jeff Krimmel, we've talked with him before on the oil, on the deal spotlight podcast, specifically Schlumberger champ X. He wrote a really nice LinkedIn post on this. I'd recommend everybody go check him out on LinkedIn and check out his newsletter where he talked about the interesting nature of the fact of this all cash deal in a world where the last seven deals that we've evaluated have all been heavily stock based. And so the real, you know, and what he points out is generally when you buy with all cash, you're issuing new debt. So the real question is, where do they see, you know, from Matador's perspective, where, you know, and that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to increase their, 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 their debt. Now they claim they're, they claim with the increase in EBITDA, they're actually going to lower their, you know, their leverage ratio. They've, they've got it right up here. Where was it? I was reading here. Preserve matrix, strong balance sheet, pro forma leverage expect to be 1.3 at closing and back by one point at 1.0 by the middle of 2025. So what they're saying is, yes, we're increasing our debt, but our leverage is going to stay the same because of the increase in EBITDA relative to these, you know, relative to these uh, um, assets. So, I mean, if you're adding revenue to your business, but you're adding debt, it can be net neutral from a debt ratio standpoint. You just better hope there's enough revenue. And that's always the key. It's always the key. It's not, is there revenue? It's, is there enough revenue to cover that right. leverage? It does look like they believe with by drilling those new locations and hopefully some net debt reductions, they can get that leverage back below what they claim their target is at 1.0. But, you know, I had actually heard rumors of this deal a couple weeks ago. You know, a, you know, Matador, as I mentioned, loves end cap stuff. So I wouldn't be surprised if the same management team now breaks off, goes by as another, uh, you know, 
consolidated acreage position out there in Delaware based in a season two years they can't flip to Matador it seems like you know NCAP and Matador seem to have a great relationship going on there specifically from a value add I think the interesting part we'll see a year from now we're going to be able to have two full right. years of the advanced energy deal and another and a full year of that and a full year um, with the Ameridev and it'll be interesting to see kind of how those have shaked out for them but I think there's a there's a clear strategy here for both Matador and NCAP that's right. Good numbers. Good management. Good numbers. Yeah, we like, I mean, Matador's right down the street here for me, right here in the Galleria here in Dallas. But they also, you know, they've proven they're one of the few companies that are still led by their CEO, founder, chairman. It's one of the few dictatorships that's working, in my opinion. Well, like my household. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll leave it at that. We love you, Lisa. It, it ain't what me. else are you working on? A bunch. Hey, I, Berkshire uh, picking up another 2.57 million more shares. 2.57 million more shares from Occidental. Well, hey, they're eventually owning at some point. Well, Berkshire Oil, is that what they're going to rebrand it, into? I, I think so. It's what they own 28.3% now. Jeez. When's Warren just going to put himself as the CEO? I don't know. Maybe he's getting ready to like do that. He's going to retire from Berkshire and go run Oxy. Yeah, I, 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 I doubt, doubt that. It. So, <laughs> all right, guys. Well, with that, we'll let you get out of here. Finish up your Thursday. We will not be who we running tomorrow before we let him go. Who we running on Friday? The podcast. I mean, uh, we've got four podcasts getting ready to rumble out. And uh, let me get the list here real quick. We've got some good ones here. It figures it's the system is a little slow here. We have coming around the corner. Ronald Stein is one of them. We have Troy Eckert finally out of production. Ronald Stein. We have Adam Goodman has just went out last week, but the transcript is going to be done. And then we have Princeana Ford going out next week. Lots of good stuff. That was a fun one. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, everybody check that out. You can hear the weekly recap on Friday. I think we will back in the chair on Monday for you guys. We appreciate you sticking with us. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Don't die of the heat, especially if you're here in Texas. Watch out for Aircott. We know they're coming for you. Um, stay cool, stay safe, and we will see you guys on Monday.